Okay, hello Northern Virginia. And actually today we're gonna have a lot of listeners, I think throughout the US and throughout the world. This is Nova Weekend Warriors, primarily geared towards recreational athletes and those new to fitness, along with the people that serve them. I'm your host, Meg Donnelly. I'm a licensed massage therapist and movement facilitator working here in Herndon, Virginia, and I'm focused on Weekend Warriors. As a disclaimer, uh, every episode of Nova Weekend Warriors should only be taken, should not be taken as advice, medical or otherwise, and should be used for entertainment purposes only. The views of guests in each episode are solely their own and not necessarily the views of Nova Weekend Warriors, Meg Donnelly in her capacity as a licensed massage therapist or Meg Donnelly in her capacity as a movement facilitator. And now that we have all that done and taken care of, I am truly excited today because I am here with Dr. Rescinda and Sherman, thank you, <laughs> Dr. Rescinda Sherman, and um, Dr. Sherman, can you do me a favor and just give us a brief introduction, and then also, I'm sure along with my disclaimer, you may want to kind of talk a little bit about that as well. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, uh, I'm uh, Rescinda Sherman, and I am an epidemiologist. And I currently, I'm a cancer epidemiologist, which means I am focused on um, the, the range of um, health questions that we have about cancer, but specifically in cancer surveillance. So tracking uh, the burden of the, of the cancer disease. So any cancer rate you've ever heard of is that's, uh, it's generated from the work that I do. Um, I started out my career being very interested in infectious disease and emerging diseases. We just had this uh, conversation prior. To, prior. Um, so I, I was trained, um, I, I was looking at dengue uh, many years ago uh, and other tropical diseases and um, that's really what prompted my interest in becoming an epidemiologist. And so I went through my master's in public health with that focus and started my career out actually in infectious disease with STDs, TB, and HIV. Um, but eventually I moved into the cancer surveillance realm. Um, mainly that's where the funding is in the United States because uh, you, you sometimes have to go where the funding stream goes. Uh, but I um, have a personal connection to um, my work in cancer. Actually, my mother passed away the same age I am today. <laughs> um, and so I still have the, that, uh, that motivation in my work. And um, I have been doing uh, cancer surveillance and uh, cancer epidemiology with a focus on geospatial work. So uh, where the cancer occurs um, and uh, what the different risk factors are based on geography, not just the environment, but the demographics of populations and how that impacts their health, particularly focused on poverty and SES variables. Um, and I've been doing that work for a couple decades now. So and I think it's um, really interesting, if you don't mind me uh, going back a little bit, but I, you'd mentioned that um, what brought you to your work in, in cancer research was that uh, there wasn't a lot of funding uh, in um, uh, uh, pan not pandemic work. I mean, well, but, well, well, actually, it, there wasn't a lot of it, of money in in preparation for pandemics. It, it's really interesting because um, w w the the books that got me motivated to get my MPH were uh, were, were discussing the exact situation that we're in right now. Uh, one of the best lay um, publications is The Coming Plague um, by, I believe it's Lori Garnett. It was published in 1994. And it, it, uh, you, you can read this uh, literature both in the scientific journals and in some of the, the lay literature. Uh, and there is nothing that is new um, other than, than the specifics of the actual pathogen. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it, it's really interesting. When I, when I first got into the field, um, there was uh, a lot of big tobacco funding. So tobacco and, and, and those um, health 
legitimately so, right? Tobacco use is a significant public health problem in the United States. Uh, but then that shifted after 9-11 and um, it became funding was based on biopreparedness. So we actually were a little more prepared around that time, not necessarily for an emergency, uh, emerging disease like the um, novel coronavirus, but something like anthrax or some, you know, some sort of um, uh, man leveraged disease or human leveraged disease. Um, and then that sort of switched and the funding really is um, changed again and we are actually less prepared uh, for the, our current situation than we were a couple decades ago, unfortunately. Yeah, and I'd like to say that I'm a little cynical because I'd like to say that like, well, let, this will at least have us more prepared for the future, but I feel like we're really good at forgetting the past. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm feeling uh, simultaneously optimistic and pessimistic just about all the time these days. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but these interactions feel good, so That's let's right. do more of these. <laughs> yeah, more of this, right? More communication. I think more communication and more education that we can do ourselves. I know for me on multiple levels, I am much more educated uh, than I was before. And a little bit shame on me as a massage therapist. I now look back and think I should have been much, I, I've learned much more about infectious diseases now than I did before. So I had a very simple intake for, you know, but as, as soon as, you know, something got clicked off, then I just went through my speech of why I couldn't see someone or would call them ahead of time and tell them why. And I think that it, with a better understanding of infectious disease, we're, I, I just think it's better overall. But let's go back to that because um, in terms of infectious diseases, that's not the only thing that epidemiologists do, I, I assume. But can you tell me a little bit about what epidemiologists do and, and why their role is so critical? Uh, yeah, we think we're critical, of course, so thank you for that. <laughs> uh, so epidemiologists, we are health scientists, but what's unique about epidemiologists is that we're population-based scientists versus individual base, uh, individual level scientists. So the individual level is really like the clinician um, and the pharmaceutical um, in individual uh, patient care approach. And epidemiologists look at the population as a whole. Um, and it, it's easiest to think of us as um, uh, disease de detectives, right? So we research the what, the who, the why of disease. Conversely, we can also do research into wellness as well, right? So any health-related questions. So epidemiologists, um, I had mentioned uh, my work in cancer surveillance. So we do disease surveillance. So this is the collecting of the data on the disease over time. And that's important to understand the etiologic origins of disease, as well as be able to predict our public health needs, right? So these models that we're seeing with COVID-19 are trying to predict um, our needs are, and whether or not we're, we'd be able to meet the ICU capacity, et cetera. So, um, so, uh, so in theory, we're able to protect, uh, uh, predict and target our current needs. And also, <laughs> we should be able to prepare for emerging disease. We did have all of the information available, um, but translating that into policy, that piece didn't happen. But so epidemiologists also use surveillance data for what we call descriptive statistics, and that's just an assessment of who's at risk and why. And descriptive statistics will, again, help target resources, um, but also help us develop hypotheses. So then uh, we go on and we test these hypotheses with, with additional research. And that's where we really narrow down what the etiology of disease and risk are. Um, we evaluate the effectiveness of clinical treatments. So of course, there's a lot of uh, discussion about um, what treatments may or may not be effective. Um, and we really need something more in, in the clinic sometimes you have to use what's available. Uh, and you might rely on anecdotal information or your own personal experience, but that is not the ideal way to practice medicine. Um, sometimes it's the only thing that we've got right now. Um, but ideally, you have these randomized clinical controlled trials and other ways to really assess the effectiveness of a treatment, which uh, when I say effectiveness, I mean both how efficacious it is and also how safe it is. Um, and then also uh, the, the same type of research can be used to identify effective public health interventions are um, uh, as 
we're, we're sort of doing these natural experiments as some states are opening and some case, some states are never closed and uh, each state has different demographics. And at some point we'll be able to put that data together and evaluate which um, uh, non-pharmaceutical uh, interventions were more effective than others. Were closing schools, was that, did that significantly impact the risk and the slow the spread, that sort of thing. Uh, but particularly for this virus though, of course, we don't have all that information currently. So we will have a wealth of information for the next one, which right. will come, uh, but we're kind of stuck in a, in a difficult position of not having that information right now. Yeah. Um, but you know, basically every health related question that you might have, we like to think it could be answered by epidemiology. So let's uh, like take in our two fields, right? You know the benefits of massage, right? You know that intuitively. That's probably you know one of the reasons you do it. As a cancer epidemiologist, there's um, you know I can just look up in the literature and see, um, particularly it, like in, in terms of cancer survivorship, not just in terms of reduced mortality, but the quality of life of cancer patients. And so preparing for this, I just looked it up to confirm. Um, that uh, the, the evidence is there that, and it appears that of course, massage is going to um, really reduce both the physical, which is pain and fatigue and the emotional burden on cancer survivors. Uh, and, you know, we can, we can uh, feel it intuitively as a patient and a provider, and we can also show it uh, with the, with the data. Yeah, this is the really interesting thing. And I, I feel like I could have a completely different sidebar with you on that because like one of the things we know is that uh, massage uh, reduces stress and anxiety. Um, and that we have studies that actually show that. The why of that, right, is, is a little bit different. Is it the one-on-one -on -one attention? Is it the bio, the psycho, the social, you know? Is it all three? Probably. And those are the things that I think with massage, it's, it's harder to, um, it's harder to come up with a really good study, right? Because if, if you're, I'm touching you, you know, that... <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, we, 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 that could be a whole nother conversation. Yeah. But for but we don't really need to know the why in in order to have a benefit, right? So we actually don't know why tobacco causes lung cancer. But we know that if you reduce your tobacco use, you reduce your risk of lung cancer. So there, there, there are important questions still to be answered, of course, but um, we don't always have to have every um, bit of information to be able to really improve the health of our community. Well, again, maybe next quarter we'll have you back and we'll talk all about that. But um, yeah, yeah, because and then, you know, that's, that's a great role into what we're going to talk about today, though, um, because today we kind of, you know, as states are opening and as people are thinking about opening their practice or already opening their practice, you know, unfortunately, because we're not being um, given, well, because we don't have all of the information, right? And some of us aren't so great about taking what's already out there. I thought it would be a good idea to ask you some of these questions um, so that we can make determinations, right? Because every day we make a determination of risk versus benefit when it comes to massage. And like right now where I am in Northern Virginia, we're a bit of a hot spot. You know, the, the risks to me, outweigh the benefits right now. It just doesn't make sense. Eventually though, right, we may need to start to move into day-to-day -day life before a vaccine. I don't know what my answer is yet, certainly. Um, I just know my answer right now is, is no, but for me, but you know, things will change. So I thought this would be a really good um, a conver you know, topic of conversation. Uh, first, I wanted to ask you, now I had looked into a few YouTube videos about epidemiology on COVID-19, and like a lot of them were way over my head. They were actually like, I think they were more meant for uh, doctors and, and kind of they were um, very much more, they, they kind of reminded me of like my old uh, college uh, lectures. <laughs> um, that were like very dry and I do better with like bells and whistles and you know teach me like I'm a first grader so I had found two videos by ninja science nerd which now are probably outdated because they were from April but they were like easy for me to digest do you have any good resources that you recommend for us to learn about the epidemiology of COVID-19 
Yeah, so that, that, it's a really good point that you mentioned there um, is that just because we had an assessment and an understanding from last month does not mean that necessarily applies right now. So we need to continually reach out and get better information. Um, but my bias is, as a general rule, I'm not fond of YouTube videos for providing information on COVID-19. And the reason is, is because now what you described is very dry and um, uh, didactic, which I would probably love. <laughs> um, but what often happens with these YouTube videos is they add soundtracks and emotional stimuli, and then that begins to influence the viewer more than the actual information. And that often happens when they're providing incorrect or inflammatory information. So I have a bit of a bias against YouTube um, videos for this. Um, so I don't, I don't have any particular recommendations. But the problem is we can't just really turn to the scientific journals yet either. We have a desperate need for data and a desperate need for information about this pandemic. So um, because of that, papers are being ex expedited to publication which is great because we need the data, but they don't undergo what um, the normal peer review process. Yes. Yeah, yeah peer review is not, um, th it, it's the gold standard, uh, but of course, you know, it's not it, perfect. Um, but what happens, I, we can call this gray literature. This gray literature, it's even harder for people outside of the field to evaluate because you can't assume even a standard level of valid, validity to the methodology. So it's not always useful to go to those papers, even if you um, uh, were more familiar with the language and that sort of thing. But I do think some of the, the mainstream press really is getting it right. And um, they're actually getting, uh, a little more in depth into um, the information. You get a really broad overview from CDC or WHO, and that's deliberate. You know, they, they don't want to um, put in all of the nuance that could be viewed as political generally, right? Um, but basically, I am still relying on information from the same media sources I rely on for other information. Okay. So my, my go-tos are NPR. Um, I think The Atlantic has done an excellent job of uh, particularly uh, reporting on COVID-19, Washington Post, New York Times. Um, so th they don't necessarily have the bells and whistles, but they, the language is often more accessible. Well, and I feel like when I start there, I really like that you said that because I feel like when I start there, then I've, I've almost acquired a taste for it and I have... <laughs> a willingness and an ability to dig further. I think one of the big, um, the big moments for me is early on, you know, it's such a polarizing topic too, right? Right now, but you know, one, early on, everyone who was kind of in the stay home forever camp was posting a study on runners and droplets. And I remember right away being like, this just dropped and People who six months ago were really skeptical and really looking into how is this peer reviewed and what were all of a sudden just blanket statementing these things. And uh, I mean, a little bit me too, I was like, well, if this is what we think right now, you know, we have to play a little bit of, if we don't know yet, let's err on the side of caution. But I think that's a really great point that, you know, we are going to have a lot of stuff that's coming out quickly. Um, and I almost wonder if it's a little bit like uh, kind of the similarity that rings for me is when um, Fauci was uh, originally very um, strict in the during the AIDS epidemic about certain medicines. And then when he spoke with um, uh, uh, patients, uh, that were afflicted with AIDS and they found out that certain treatments were working, um, they decided to allow those treatments, even though we didn't have all of the studies completed yet, um, because we, we weighed the risk and the benefits and, and yeah. changed our mind. And so I think it, this, this seems a little bit similar to that in that we can't, we can't take everything that comes out as like hard fact, right? And we rarely do anyway, but I don't know, does, does that similarity make? Yeah, so you're talking about compassionate use in mm -hmm. the clinical setting, right? And so not, we didn't have the luxury of being able to wait for the epidemiology to confirm or deny, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I think that um, as these studies come out, it's really important for um, c colleagues in my field to promote the ones that 
are likely to be more solid in terms of methodology and to really speak up when they see flaws. Um, so, and that's really the best, the best we can do. And I do think that that does happen, um, but not it doesn't necessarily play out in the public realm. So that's happening in private groups, um, mm -hmm. par private infectious disease, epidemiology groups, and different networks that we're in. And so we're communicating with each other. And it, that's valuable to have those private groups too, right? Because sometimes you'll voice something with a certain level of uncertainty that you wouldn't necessarily voice um, as a, like a public health me message. Um, but I do think there needs to be a, a little more activity of, of uh, trying to communicate what the message might be behind just posting the, the, you know, but this has been happening for years, right? Zinc cures cancer, you know, vitamin right. C does everything. And, and so the, the, we're, we're familiar with it. It's just that the risk is so much higher and there's a lot of, uh, you know, people are fearful. Um, we need to be cautious. We should not be fearful, um, but we can't help sometimes how we're, we, we're, we're dealing with anxiety and whatnot. Um, so the messaging is really difficult. So I think like if you're thinking about social media and sharing information as a consumer, um, I'd be, I would just be very cautious about that. Maybe reach out to someone that you trust. If it's something that's clinical, maybe you know someone in the medical field that can sort of weigh in on it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of times it just gets reported with an inflammatory headline and it's not as useful um, to either help us feel better or help change our, our, our behaviors in a way that's going to be healthy. I love that. And I think, right, that's part of the reason why we're having this conversation today is, you know, when I had reached out to um, my, I think it was on Facebook, I had reached out to all of my, actually, you know where it came from originally? A good friend of mine, uh, Phyllis Simon, who is a uh, lawyer in intellectual property, had uh, I, I was kind of going through a dilemma of what I know and what I don't know with my career and, and how to disseminate information. And she had recommended I reach out to an epidemiologist and then recommended you for me to connect with. And once I did, I was like, oh, wait, we should definitely have a, a larger conversation that everyone can hear. So thank you. All right. So let's go over some general questions about COVID-19. Um, and, uh, and when I put these together originally, I think some things have maybe changed or maybe we're a little bit sure of or a little bit more unsure of. But my first question is, can people who have uh, antibodies protect themselves from reinfection but still be carriers and spread to others? And do we know yet how long antibodies could protect someone? So th that has a couple of components to that question. So first, antibodies. Um, antibodies indicate a past infection, not a current infection. So, um, or maybe a vaccination, right? Then you have, you have antibodies. So, so because someone has antibodies, they're, they're not going to be infectious. They, in order to be contagious or infectious, they have to have a current uh, infection. So they have to have the, the virus and has to be viable. They have to have it in, in their, in their, um, their, their body, mucus, fluids, whatnot. Um, so, but the, the antibodies are your, uh, your body's response to, uh, be d defeating the, what, whatever the assault is, right? So the antibodies, in most cases, uh, what we know about viruses, if you, if you have the antibodies, then you are immune to it. There are exceptions, um, and antibodies may not um, confer immunity for a long period of time, but generally, the percentage of antibodies in your, in your system decrease over time, right? So we get booster shots, uh, right, for uh, measles, mumps, rubella, uh, when, when, during pre pregnant women. Get it, that's why we have different uh, schedules for vaccines uh, for, for that particular purpose. Um, but at this point, you've probably heard the news that um, uh, so people were talking about getting tested for antibodies and then having like a work release card, you know, assuming that they're, they're not um, uh, at risk anymore. There's a lot of ethical problems with that, right? But the other issue is that we don't know for certain that if you have the antibodies that you are immune. However, the lack of evidence doesn't mean that 
it doesn't mean the reverse. So it doesn't mean that we aren't going to be immune and it doesn't mean that we aren't immune for maybe a year or two. It's just that we don't have the evidence there yet. But it, in most cases, if you, if you have antibodies to an infection, then you are immune um, for a, a, a period of time. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's a double-edged sword. We don't want to um, make that assumption uh, but we also don't want to just throw in the towel and assume that that no one is ever going to, going to be immune. The the current thinking really is, um, however we achieve herd immunity, which is not a public health uh, response. It is a um, it's a it's a uh, biologic condition of the population. But if we get it by vaccine or we get it over a long period of time through um, natural exposures. Uh, we still are fairly confident that that will be protective for our, our, our communities. Okay, great. Thank you. So I've seen some research on hard surface fomites um, ranging from like eight hours for chrome, I think, and then five days on wood. Um, but I haven't seen any research on fabrics. Um, do we, what do we know about COVID-19 and fabrics? So first of all, uh, stepping back a little bit, all of the the the, the numbers, hours to days, um, the the Princess Two or whatever that ship was, they said, oh, after 30 days we found this. So there's a couple of things to consider when we're looking at these numbers. The testing on fomites are um, are done uh, under what they call ideal conditions. They are lab generated conditions, which we do not see in real life. So what that means is that these lab based estimates are on the, the the long range. So they're likely over estimates, right? Um, so that's just something to keep in mind that we we don't usually have laboratory conditions. The other thing to keep in mind is just because there's genetic material still there and still able to be detected does not mean it's viable for transmission. So again, these um, uh, are likely to be overestimates in terms of transmission. Now, fabrics. The good news is there's not a whole lot of research on uh, fabrics, fabrics specifically because they're, they're considered to be much lower risk. So non-porous surfaces are where viruses will tend to stay and remain viable for longer periods of time. But anything that's porous, what it does is if the respiratory droplet lands, um, it basically dries it out. And so these viruses have a lipid membrane, and as soon as they're dried out, they are no longer infectious. So it's not risk-free, but it is much lower risk to touch fabrics that may have had um, uh, a, a virus or respiratory droplets on them. Um, so you might have actually heard about how a mask is less effective when it's wet. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've heard that, uh, but that's the same principle, but in reverse. So wet fabrics, of course, will keep it more viable because it won't break that membrane or dry it out. Okay. Um, but in most cases, uh, fabrics, is, uh, fabrics are a much lower risk than non-porous uh, surfaces. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, that, and that, that kind of rolled into our next question, right? So we talked a little bit about um, uh, cloth masks and um, uh, in the beginning we were told don't wear them, then we were told to wear them. In my state it's recommended. Uh, we're coming to a point where it may be mandatory for indoors, um, but uh, I think it's really confusing for the public uh, because there was that cross messaging earlier on and um, uh, because we also see officials uh, talking about it um, and then not uh, heeding their own advice. So can, can you talk a little bit about the effectiveness of cloth masks? Um, and I think a lot of us, especially as massage therapists, are, understand a little bit more that we're wearing a mask um, in hopes of protecting our droplets from reaching someone else versus protecting ourselves. But can you talk a little, are there numbers around that? Do we know, you know? Yeah, so, th so the answer really depends on what you mean by effective. Okay. So um, the problem with the messaging is that, and I, I, I uh, fell into the same trap. To protect yourself, cloth masks are not very effective. And there's a variety of reasons for that. Um, but using cloth masks, as you said, to protect others from your respiratory droplets is fairly effective. I mean, it's the it's a better version of <clears throat> covering your, your, your cough, right? It, 
it reduces how far your respiratory droplets are going to spread. So really when you're wearing a cloth mask, then you are um, pr uh, protecting the environment around you. That is the goal. Um, and so it is fairly effective at, at protecting others from you. It's not very effective, effect, very effective at protecting you from others. But when you're thinking about an individual exchange, that's very different than what we think about in epidemiology. We're looking at the population. So right now, basically everyone in the world who has not already been exposed is at risk of getting COVID-19 because it's new, it's novel. So if you distribute a very low effectiveness over a large number of people, you can still have an impact on a, a large number of individuals. So maybe half a percent of a billion is still a couple hundred thousand people, right? Or uh, I should, <laughs> I can't do higher level math. I'm not going to do the math, but, 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 but so, so when the, when the, when the risk is, is large um, in terms of numbers of people at risk, then a lower, um, something that's, that may not be, uh, that, that confers some level of effectiveness can still have a really good public health impact. Um, so yeah, so cloth, um, ma it, 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 and it, it's, it is so disheartening how political this has become. Um, and it's, um, so I wear a mask when I'm indoors anywhere, uh, obviously not in my own home, mm -hmm. but I wear a mask in the grocery store. Um, I wear a mask anywhere where I'm going inside. If I'm outside and I'm on a trail and someone is going to pass me, I will put on my mask. And th this is something from the very beginning for me personally, um, I was counseling people to assume they have the virus because we know that many people are asymptomatic and it's still transmittable, right? So that's why I wear the mask. And I, but at the same time, I'm also very cautious about how I remove the mask because potentially it, there could be virus on the outside from someone else. Um, so there, I, I um, uh, definitely support using masks. Um, I don't think that they're particularly useful in some settings, uh, maybe when you're biking or running, uh, just because they'll get wet and they'll be less effective. So that's where the, the, the social distance or the physical distancing really is, uh, is also important. So it's not just one or the other, it's the hand washing, it's the physical distance and the wearing of masks uh, that are important. Mm -hmm. um, but particularly, we should not be wearing N95 masks as the general public. I think you, uh, most people probably understand that. We are not in the same risk category of being infected as someone who is working in the medical setting. And so those really need to preserve, be preserved for those people. Um, surgical masks, some of them can be a little more protective than cloth masks. So someone like you, um, if you were to be providing massages, then a surgical mask would be more appropriate. Those are also more appropriate for other frontline, like grocery workers, that sort of thing. And then for the rest of us that really are at lower risk, the cloth masks are, are the best. And, and part of the messaging too is um, we're, we, we just sort of shifted uh, what we meant by effect, but, but what, what we defined the term effectiveness as, right? So switching it from protection to me to protecting community. So that's one of it. And also because we had had two and a half months, well, we've had longer, but we've had two and a half months to get our um, PPE distribution in order, and we have not. So the science in terms of how effective cloth, cloth masks are has not changed. They're not suddenly more effective, but we have fewer options at our disposal. We have fewer interventions to offer people to reduce their risk. And so that's why um, the uh, wearing the cloth mask are really being um, highlighted a lot in uh, by public health officials. Sure. Well, and also I think too, like there were some um, studies uh, that I saw on N95 masks and surgical masks. And um, honestly, it's, you really, you almost need, you need to kind of take a course in how to wear them properly oh, and, yeah. and practice how to wear them properly and how to take them on and take them off um, in order for them to be effective. So they had like, I think it was like surgical masks and cloth masks ended up with the same number, like in terms of effectiveness, but it was because of, it was outside of a healthcare setting and it was, you know, 
we're not really great, I mean, at following directions. And I'll tell you, I think I am until you put me on a recording and I go, I didn't touch my face at all. And then I'll go back and watch this video and be like, oh my God, yeah. you rubbed your nose three times and you, you know, but I mean, I've got 45 years of, of training myself to do that, right? So untraining is us is, is really hard. But yeah, no, I agree with you. And I think that that is something very critical to repeat that we are not in a place right now, even if your area, and then I think this is a kind of part of the problem where we are, our hospitals, aren't reporting in my area a shortage of, I should say in, in our state, aren't reporting a shortage of PPE, but there are still shortages elsewhere, one. So don't, I don't, you know, still you should not be taking that away. And two, you think you know how to put it on right, and you don't. And there are other considerations around that, right? Like you shouldn't be wearing a mask for, you know, 12 hours out of the day, there's other like risk factors. Well, I shouldn't say you shouldn't. There are risk factors with all of this, right? Am I on the right path? Yeah, we are, um, we're useless when it comes to appropriate mask use. Yeah. And you've seen it. <laughs> Down below the nose, yeah. hanging from the ear, cross-contamination. Yeah. Um, so that does even make it less effective, but we can work on that. Right. Yeah, sure. we, can, we can take our mask off carefully. We can uh, wash it every day. There are things that we can do for sure. Um, but, you know, people, surgeons wear N95 masks for 12 hours at a time for surgery. Right. Yeah. And um, it is the, the this discussion about how somehow there is a health um, risk from wearing masks they're not comfortable, they can create anxiety, um, et cetera, but there is really not a risk, um, a health risk for, from wearing the mask. It's mainly that they're just uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, let's see. So um, my next question for you um, is, uh, yeah, well, actually, before I go to my next question, um, we have a joke in Virginia and we call it the mascot because it, everyone wears it around their neck like an ascot. And I always think, how do you get that up and down properly without contaminating yourself? Like, you know. You don't. Yeah, you don't. exactly. So, um, but, you, you know, we're, we're, you're, we're, we're lucky, though. I mean, it's, it's not easy to transmit um, the, the virus that way. I mean, you, uh, you have, everything has to work, right? your hands have to touch a certain spot where it's still viable and with a certain amount of time has to touch your mouth or you have to walk into a certain you know, so um it, you know it, it's we're we're lucky because the transmission of covid 19 is not something like measles it mm -hmm. is not as infectious and um so we just need to leverage that benefit as much as we can sure and so that brings me to my next question, and this is probably similar, so my, you might be able to answer this more quickly, but um, there's some talk in my field of um, removing clothes in between clients, and should we be wearing button downs versus pulling over our head? Is there a danger by pulling it over our head of infecting ourselves? Um, or wearing buffs, so a lot of my runners will kind of wear the buff around their neck and then pull that up and pull that down if they're passing someone. Do you, do you have any feelings on, 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 on that subject? Yeah, so um, again, we are talking about a spectrum of risk, right? Mm -hmm. There is nothing that's zero risk at this point, right? So we want to move towards the lower risk spectrum. That's our goal. Um, I would not use the word dangerous when talking about any of these activities, right? Um, but we still need to be prudent. So um, it really depends on how likely you are to have the virus on your clothes or your, your face covering, right? Mm -hmm. So if it's on there, then it is riskier to take it off over your head. If it's not on there, it's not a risk, right? The key, of course, the kicker is you don't know. Um, sometimes you'll you might be contacted by someone that you've that you've uh, a contact tracer and you know that you've been exposed, but generally it's not within a period of time that would be useful for you. So yeah, I would certainly recommend button down, 
okay. I mean, why, why increase your risk, right? right. There's, no, there's no reason to, um, you know, sort of that, that's why lab coats are buttons or they're, they, you don't pull them off over your head. Um, so um, again, if, uh, if the virus is there shaking it or moving it around, your clothing could put it back into the air. So then instead of touching it and then touching your mouth, then you could breathe it in and be exposed. So I am very careful when I take off my mask and I put it in one direction. Um, I put it, um, if, it, if it's in the car, for instance, I put the the, the, the face part up in hopes that the heat and the, the UV light will help um, uh, move the virus from to non-viable more quickly. Um, but I w wouldn't think of removing clothes or your mask as an inherently dangerous activity because that is not helpful for our capacity to make good decisions, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. We don't, um, so yeah, so I would definitely, uh, no, um, no, uh, a turtleneck that you're taking on and off between patients and something like that is probably on the riskier end, something that you can unzip um, or just, you know, have a, um, like a smock that you can remove easily, something like that would probably be um, a good idea. Great. So can you, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about um, uh, the, like rooms themselves. So can you talk to me about in the same kind of level as those fabrics we were talking about, like curtains and rugs, uh, especially, and lampshades and other fabrics that can't be laundered um, between each interaction. Should we be, you know, do, do you recommend that we remove all of those? Do you think we're relatively okay if we keep some of those? I know the recommendation, I think, by the CDC in terms of like getting your offices prepared is if you're going to have carpets to vacuum in between and and that concerned me as well because I thought, well, does vacuuming kind of kick things back up into the air versus keep them settled? There seems so many unknowns. Can you talk a little bit about those soft fabrics in a hard space? Yeah. So um, what a lot of this guidance is based on what we know about SARS and uh, the and, and the related viruses, right? Um, and it most of what we're learning about COVID nineteen, or well, that's the disease of the novel coronavirus, is that it still acts very similarly to SARS, uh, with thankfully a lower mortality rate. So um, again, grateful for that. Um, so yeah, I don't think there's any issue with vacuuming because again, it's the respiratory droplets, right? It's it's not. Um, there's very little evidence that the um, virus can be aerosolized and really floating in the air. Um, but the good news is you don't necessarily touch a curtain or a lampshade, right? You might bump into it or something like that. But if this, these, these are not considered fomites um, because they're not shareable. People don't touch them frequently. Um, and again, most of them are non -por are porous surfaces, so the virus is going to be less viable on those surfaces. What we really want to limit, okay, first of all, if you if, can manage your anxiety better by removing the curtains or by removing objects um, from a room, by all means do that, because that's also important. For me personally, I would say it's very low risk, um, so if you're comfortable with that, then keep your office as is. What you need to focus on and eliminate are things that are shared that really meet that fomite definition. Pens, for instance. Um, uh, if people are still required to, required to sign by pen, um, have clean pens, put them in the dirty, just like spoons, right, when you, when you sample. Um, no touch uh, visas, th that sort of thing would be important. Um, the handles on doors, if you go into restaurants, a lot of them just have the doors open. And that's one of the reasons why, because those are really the areas that people touch more often and are more likely to, um, to really transmit the virus. Yeah. And that's, that piece, I think, is just so easy. One, you can have people prepay ahead of time. And it does not increase or de I mean, check with your credit card provider, but it doesn't increase or decrease your risk factors in terms of uh, if somebody, you know, later on comes back and says, you know, it's an, it disputes the charge. Um, and, and to me, that's just a very simple and easy way to do that. And we have touchless systems. So with touchless systems now available, spend the 50 bucks, get, the, get it so that people can, if, if you have to do it in person, people can then do it without touching 
anything. Right. Although, you know, that we'll, we'll get to that because that always brings up a really great point, right? I do all this like no touch stuff and then I'm sorry, sorry, I'm sorry, touch you, but we'll get to that. Um, <laughs> What, can you talk a little bit about the role that HVAC units, air conditioning and heat play in the spread of droplets? And would separate rooms on the same system be better or worse? Because that's a lot of us kind of each have our own individual offices with, within a larger office. So there is specific industry guidance for HVAC systems, and I am not an expert in that, um, and I can provide you with some links if you would like those. Um, but really, that's probably beyond you as well. You have to be able to work with whoever is managing those systems for you. Okay. Um, but again, this is one of those issues where it is both yes and no. So yes, absolutely HVAC uh, systems can transmit viruses particles through the air from one location to another. I think most of us have read the, um, uh, the study about being in the restaurant and how it spread much farther than six feet. So that is, that is a legitimate concern. However, <laughs> um, a non, a, a, an area that's not well ventilated is also a risk. So if you um, are in an area where the, the, there is no airflow that is also um, considered risky. There, so there's ways to mitigate that risk. Again, there's some industry guidance um, that you would have to rely on your provider, your systems operational people to, to comply with. Basically, particularly with air conditioning or anything that's taking the humidity out of the air, it's a little bit different than the fabric, right? So I talked about how the respiratory droplet falls on the fabric and then it dries out and it becomes less viable. Well, in the air, as you dry out that respiratory droplet, it becomes smaller and lighter and more likely to rise up and potentially have a greater movement, right? So that's, um, that's an issue. So when you look at the guidance, they often will have a humidity level that you need to meet. So to, to try to mitigate to mitigate that. Um, so um, basically the my recommendation is if you are if you have an older system that or an operations uh, support that they're, they're just not able to follow those guidelines to mitigate risk then open windows and keep a well ventilated room in that way. And I'm sure there's some areas where they're indoors and that's really difficult. Um, and also it's a little bit difficult for, you know, massages can be intimate, right? So you don't really want <laughs> the, the whole world walking by, um, but the, we need to have some sort of, of, of ventilation uh, while you're doing that. Okay. Um, and, and, and speaking of which, is transmission, if transmission is primarily coming from respiratory droplets, right? And we're kind of, I think what we're talking about right now is how a, a, a unit or humidity could carry those further. Is that about it? Um, right. So the drier it is, the more likely they are to travel yeah. further because they, okay. they're tight. Yeah. So in careers that can't keep six foot or more, like yours truly, um, how does closer contact change our risks? Does the amount of time matter? And obviously the wearing of masks from both parties, right? So yeah, wearing masks, of course, is going to be a benefit, but it has to be both. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really, it's a numbers game. The closer you are to someone, the more you're in there, the, in the space where they exhale. So it, the respiratory droplets, if they have the virus in them, it's going to be a denser area. So the closer you are to someone, the more likely you are to encounter that. Um, obviously, closer to the head is different than closer to maybe the feet and other extremities. Mm -hmm. um, and time, time is, is also important. The longer you're there, the more chances you get of being, you know, it's, it's a little bit like Russian roulette. Mm -hmm. You keep firing that and eventually you're going to get to the bullet, right? So um, the particularly appointments, 60 minutes or longer, um, the, the risk just increases. Um, and that's just, that's how statistics work, right? <laughs> if there's, but if there's no virus, then there's no risk. Um, but again, you don't know 
you don't know often who is at risk. Um, I think that someone, it, the, the better relationship you have with your clients, the more likely they are to be honest with you and not um, maybe lie about their symptoms, right? But as, there's plenty of asymptomatic people that have no idea that they are shedding the virus. Um, so it, it, it's, uh, it, is a, it is a higher risk activity for sure. Okay. So we are hearing that people are testing positive many weeks after they've been diagnosed and their complications have been much longer than 14 days. Um, are we still relatively confident that the virus is only contagious for about 14 days? Okay, so that is actually a bit of a um, misunderstanding. Okay. So the 14 day time period is what we call the incubation period. So it really ranges from about two, I think maybe the highest might have been 16 days. So the two weeks is, is a, a pretty good ballpark range. So if you think you might have been exposed or if you have encountered someone who turned out to be positive, then that you need to spend 14 days in isolation. Uh, because you might get it, right? And then you might infect people before you become symptomatic, that sort of thing. So the 14 days is really the incubation period. In terms of contagion, um, as long as someone has an active infection, they are contagious. Of course, also asymptomatic uh, folks can be contagious too, but it, there is some evidence that if you're asymptomatic, that you're not shedding as much of the virus, so you're less contagious. But people are um, battling this illness for weeks and weeks and weeks, um, you know, far more than 14 days in many cases, particularly if you have the complications. Mm -hmm. So the period of being infectious is much longer, but those people are not going to be coming into your office for a massage. So this brings up a really good question, and this is um, something we didn't talk about ahead of time, but now has me thinking. In the past, if I would always ask somebody if they had cold or flu symptoms, and it used to be within the last seven days, um, and uh, if they had any symptoms within the last seven days, then I wouldn't see them and we would reschedule. Um, uh, would, would you say that that was a misunderstanding as well in terms of I could have potentially, they could potentially have started symptoms seven days ago, but still have symptoms, and then I probably shouldn't be seeing them. Oh, definitely. If they have any symptoms, I, I, yeah, you, you would not want to see them. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, but the problem is, too, is that this disease can have a wide range of symptoms, right? Mm -hmm. So basically anyone who has any illness at all, yeah. I yeah. would recommend, and unless you have a specific clar uh, a clarification of what their illness is, you might be cautious about seeing mm -hmm. a patient that has would, anything, would, even like uh, gastrointestinal issues, um, you know, it, the, the, the whole gamut. Yeah, and we have a, a, a list of those, like um, uh, many, there's many different sources for the list of, symptoms. There's actually a really new great diagram that John Hopkins put out that's like shows the head to toe symptoms all the mm -hmm. way around that just kind of blew my mind. But um, at, to sidetrack off of COVID for a moment, I'm, I'm wondering if, if that's not a best practice for other um, infectious diseases like cold or flu even. Um, that we probably shouldn't be seeing someone if they have any symptoms? Or it, is that because that's a different strain and so different, you know, it, are we still under the belief, or <laughs> maybe you're not under the belief, I was still under the belief that, you know, you can kind of still have symptoms far after you're contagious. Yeah, so I think people that sort of the um, often say, oh, you're most contagious bef right before you get sick, which in some cases is true. Um, but you are still contagious while you're sick. Um, and, but it really depends on what you're thinking about. So if you've had the flu shot and it's effective for the strain that year, have, you know, working with someone with the flu is really a low risk to you, right? Mm -hmm. And as long as you um, t do all the other infection control and hygiene, then it's not going to be a risk to the next person that comes in either. The common cold, it's an inconvenience, but really it's low risk as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that that seven day balance is probably based on 
the diseases that we are familiar with, mm -hmm. right? So we know that it's it's the that that's likely to be um, an appropriate time period because mm -hmm. uh, it's based on some sort of guideline, right? That you didn't make this up yourself. No, no. I mean, uh, yeah. And well, and that's, that's a whole nother story for a whole nother day, how we don't have, you know, we, we, so we are state by state um, okay. in terms of, and so it's a big, that's right. a big mess for a whole okay. nother day, but right. we have resources to help us weigh the risk versus the benefits and make mm -hmm. those sorts of decisions. I certainly revisited a bunch of those since this has That's happened. Right. right. And I'm, you know, I'm not afraid to say that I am realizing as much of a clean freak as I was and as good as I was at certain things, I have to make a lot of changes. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. Let me go to our next question. But I'm going to go off screen to cough for a moment. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, is there a possibility that COVID-19 becomes like seasonal flu where we may have to guess the strain seasonally and it may require an annual vaccine? Uh, sure. It's a possibility. Um, so the so far the corona the novel coronavirus really looks more like many of the common cold viruses um and and so they change um they clearly don't have the same level of mortality thankfully um but yeah they change every season you can get a cold one week you can get it three months later because it's a different strain um viruses definitely mutate um and that is a risk however so far it appears that the virus really is not mutating that much. Um, and there are a number of strains, but they don't appear to be um, indicative of severity or type of symptoms. Um, and because they don't differ that much from each other in terms of the structure of the virus, which is with the shape of the virus is really what's important uh, when you're trying to develop a vaccine. Um, it, it's likely that we that if we create a safe and efficacious vaccine that will work for all of the strains. The key, of course, is really understanding um, what it means to create a safe and efficacious vaccine. Creating a testable vaccine as we can see, can be done in a matter of months. Making sure that it, it, it is effective to protect people against the virus and that it's safe generally takes years and years. And I know that people are, oh, 12 to 18 months, 12 to 18 months. Uh, that would be in a, in, a, in a completely ideal world. We've really truncated the amount of time to, uh, we have a number of, vi of va potential vaccines that are out on, uh, to be tested. Um, so we've really truncated that development time, but we still need the time to see how that works, um, both from the biological as well as the transmission um, perspective. So um, at this point, um, I, I mean, I, I, there's really no, people are very concerned about these different strains and the mutation, but there's no evidence really that that is going to be a problem in terms of having an effective uh, vaccine. Okay. There's other issues, though, that are involved with vaccine development. Sure. All right. So I want to be really respectful for, of your time. And we've spent about an hour, but I have. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I have 10 more questions. Do you have time to still sit sure. with us? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Fabulous. And you can just give me the thumbs down or give me a note if we need to kind of, you know, call it. Um, I wanted to move to a little bit more, a, a few questions that are a little bit more specific to massage and fitness professionals. Uh, and the first one I have is as massage therapists and for some of our boutique fitness studios, our work is typically done in very small rooms that can be 100 to 144 square feet. So we talked about it a little bit when we talked about airflow, but do you have any recommendations and, and can you talk a little bit about how size and, and circulation of airflow in a room can affect COVID-19 transmission? Yeah, so again, a well-ventilated room is important. Um, generally, smaller rooms are considered riskier, but the risk is because people are brought close together, right? So if you, um, but you're only gonna have two people in that room, 
and the, the mere act of massage is going to bring you close to that person. So you can do this in a large room or a small room. Um, the, the, the physical size of the room in this case isn't necessarily an additional risk factor. It's the ventilation. So the, the, the better ventilation, the, um, the lower the risk. Gotcha. And so this is where I'm having trouble because I, my mind goes back to the restaurant study of the mm -hmm. HVAC came in, hit the um, asymptomatic affected person. It traveled in this straight line. Everybody in that airflow got sick and then nobody on the right side of the room got sick or like one or two people got sick, right? So if I'm in a room and I'm ventilating it well, am I not kind of I don't know how this is very layman's term, but am I not forcing it from them right in right up my nose? <laughs> so the reason that restaurants are so risky is because you cannot wear a mask while you're eating. Okay. Right. And also sometimes you share utensils and you touch common items. And so you will be with one person with a mask. Mm -hmm. Right. So and you're already within that six feet. So you're already increasing your risk. Mm -hmm. So you're not increasing your risk anymore by the ventilation, but the gotcha. ventilation will bring it from the room elsewhere and away from you. Okay. Um, so that, so that's the, that's the idea. Um, but it, for sure, anytime it's, if the, the respiratory droplet is small enough to move through the air, sure, you know, yeah. but you are already in their space of less than six feet. So you're already at risk. Right. You're, so you're, you're, you're having, you're in a higher risk category because you're within six feet of someone for any amount of time, but especially right. when it's 30, 60, 90 minutes, right. you know, and right. obviously the, you're, you're right. Statistically, you're higher risk each time you add an extra minute. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So it, it, and it's not, so it's kind of like flipping a penny though, right? Right. Just because you flip the penny and it comes up heads 10 times does not mean it's still not a 50, 50 chance for heads and tails the next time. Right. So it, the risk isn't additive, but every time you're there, it's the same risk of exposure and you just have many more opportunities to be exposed. Gotcha. I, I love that you just talked about that because that's not the way my mind wants to work. Yeah, and it sounds so, cumulative, right? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's good we can still laugh about this, right? So it's sometimes recommended. Okay, so we talked about this already. I was just going to go back to airing out the rooms in between clients. I think that you're kind of saying if there's a way to keep airflow even during a client, uh, uh, while a client is there, that might be good as well, certainly afterwards. And um, we talked a little bit about the risk of like kicking up virus particles from surfaces into the air. Um, and if you don't have a room with windows, you know, should actually this we didn't talk about, you don't have a room with windows, you decide you're going to take the risk, you're going to wear a mask, your client's going to wear a mask. Um, that's many massage therapists have a windowless room with one door and it's a hundred square feet, you know? And so in that case, would giving additional time between clients for the droplets to settle make sense at that point is, does the risk just start over? Um, and like what time, what timing would you recommend for that? And then again, it would go, I mean, vacuuming we've already talked about, so we don't have to go through that again. Yeah, so um, I would, in terms of specific guidance with a time, um, I'm not qualified to answer that. I mean, I would just turn to whatever CDC is recommending if they have made those recommendations. Okay. But from an educated um, assessment based on how this works, so you have the respiratory droplets, right? And there's gravity, right? So the, they're likely to just fall to the surfaces rather quickly. They're, now, again, if they're drier and lighter, then possibly they're floating around. Um, but you're not in, um, in an area. So where they have seen these aerosolized um, particles is in high-risk situations, like in areas where people are being intubated, right? That's mm -hmm. not happening here. Mm -hmm. You also are not doing a highly aerobic activity. So um, looking at transmission in gyms, 
um, yoga and Pilates, very low risk. Uh, I mean, even though there's deep exhale, um, th there's a much lower risk of people in the same room transmitting the virus than you, than you have for something like Zumba or something where you're um, church choirs as well. Same sort of thing. When you're doing a lot of exhalation and it's going to go farther, um, then it has more of an opportunity. But the, the lower impact activities are, are less risky. Um, but again, I'm, I cannot say a certain number of minutes, but we do have gravity working in our favor. Okay. And that actually brings up a really good point too, because like humidity, like there's a lot of like new training that um, requires humidity, right? Hot yoga. Um, there's some uh, strength training that's done with heat. Um, and, and should we re be rethinking that as well? So again, the higher humidity is going to be beneficial because the the droplets are going to be okay. bigger, wetter, heavier, and fall quicker. So it's the opposite. Right. Like, exactly, they're not going to be floating around. It's like the humidity is like an anti diuretic, right? So <laughs> you're going to be. Um, but the important piece to think about when you're thinking about moving from one client to another is that you don't want them to interact. You want to limit your interaction. So um, don't have them waiting in the waiting room. Don't have any overlap. I yeah. think that is is um, is also critical. Okay, great. Um, how dangerous is viral threat or viral shed between touching someone else's skin, um, or you know, uh, could there be a risk of you know droplet to skin, skin to person? How does that work? Okay, so again, um, I would shy away from the word dangerous. Okay, yes, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, but no, no, it's, so, you know, we, we, we have the capacity to mitigate our risk a little yeah. bit, right? And it's not useful to um, increase anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, I think a, some of the public health messages really are designed to increase anxiety to get people to comply. And I'm not sure that's necessarily the most effective way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but no, the virus is not shed through your skin, right? Um, it's just like any other surface. So you could cough and then transmit it. You know, it, it, you know it's the cross-contamination. Okay. Um, so you just wash your hands, right? Yeah. Before you touch anybody, you wash your hands. Mm -hmm. And then like we're, we're, we had new guidelines come out from our Federation of State Massage Boards and... Um, uh, they were talking about just making sure too you have hand sanitizer close by, right? So if you do kind of something that could be cross contaminating, you can stop, use your hand sanitizer properly. That's a whole nother story, right? And then, you know, pausing and then going back to the work. Um, same right. thing with your clients. If your clients, you know, touch their mask or do something, having them hand sanitize again before you get started. Um, yeah, and just a quick note about hand sanitizer it's easy to put hand sanitizers around and it's better than not having anything, but yeah. the most effective is just regular soap and water. Soap so there's water. a couple of, couple of things. Um, the mere act of rubbing your hands actually will also help um, destroy the membrane. Um, then there's the soap that helps and then there's the running water and the hot water. Um, and the sanitizer is also useful, uh, but the more we use these um, sanitizers and disinfectants, we're also running the risk of creating other problems with other bacteria that will become resistant, right? Okay. So the more we can just use regular soap, if you have access to a sink or you can just run in, wash your hands and come back, um, the better it will be for future pathogens that, you know, we're, we're surrounded by them, right? Um, and they are um, easily taken care of by bleach or, or whatever currently, but we want to make sure that we continue to um, be able to use hygiene against those as well. So if you can do just soap and water, okay. that is the best. So it kind of is like the anti, what was that like for a while? We were using antibacterial everything for a while, and then we were like, oh no, wait a minute, this is not a good idea. Exactly, okay. exactly. Same idea. Okay. So um, many of our surfaces are somewhere between porous and non-porous in our work. Um, a good example being there are like pleather-like covers that go over our tables or over gym equipment. Um, 
these are recommended to be cleaned with EPA disinfectants, but um, according to like the companies that make them, but does the combination of pleather and stretch make them more susceptible to collecting germs, viruses? Yeah, I think that uh, again, for COVID-19, uh, for, for the coronavirus, mm -hmm. um, we are, um, th th it's the non-porous surfaces that are the greatest risk and the porous surfaces that are the least risk. So something that's sort of in between is probably in between. I don't have any evidence to back that up, um, but that's my understanding of how it, uh, th that's the, what we call biologically plausible answer. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, I don't think it's inherently worse than anything. Um, and, and the fact that it's partially porous is a, it reduces the risk. Okay. Um, for massage, some of us practice, they call it either ashiatsu or, I shouldn't say or, ashiatsu, barefoot massage, but it's practiced with your feet. So depending on how tall you are, you could be anywhere from, you know, four to six feet away from a person when you're practicing. Um, typically, the client is lying on a table near or on the ground and the massage therapist is standing. So I would say, what is the risk to the provider in that case? And because from a gravity perspective, you're higher and someone's lower, would there be a greater risk to the um, client as well? Yeah, so I think that's probably the lowest risk type of massage you can do, because okay. you are putting space between you and your client. Um, you'll both be wearing masks, and yes, if you're exhaling, at the respiratory droplets are going to go to the ground because, again, gravity. Um, but when you look at masks, the biggest risk are really these bunched up areas. So, and then coming up when you, like if you have glasses and they fog up, that's air escaping. Um, so the, the respiratory droplets are probably going out this way. Um, so I would just recommend that it's wide enough to go under your chin and to fit snugly enough, right? So anything that goes out this way or sort of up um, would be uh, less risky because obviously you don't want it to just completely drop on someone. However, I'm assuming in many cases they're on their stomach and you're walking on their back. I've never had this type of massage. I would like to try it. Um, but you're not going to lick your back, right? <laughs> you can't really even reach your back. So even if there were to be, um, you know, either on their sheet or their clothing or even just their, their bare skin, those areas are much less likely to somehow transmit the virus back. Even your stomach. It's really your hands um, that yeah, we're touching our face all the time and we're, we're eating and putting food in our mouths and touching other things. Um, so it's less risky to have something on parts of your body than it is on your actual hands. Gotcha. And again, that would go back to like hand washing, right? Because you'd be getting on and off of the mat. So potentially it could touch the mat or you could, it could hit your hands while you're working. But if you are diligent and wash your hands as a client afterwards and, and obviously wash your hands and your elbows and all of that good stuff as a practitioner, um, you should be a little bit, uh, uh, your risk should be slightly less. Yes, it would be getting lower away risk. From, yeah. And getting away from the word <laughs> dangerous. Um, all right, but speaking of which, uh, DVTs are a contra contraindication for massage, and many and massage you, therapists you, are concerned. You thrombrosis, right? Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. Yes, oh, no, 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 I just want to make sure we're talking about the same thing. <laughs> yep. No, no, that's very helpful, and, and I guess I should say clotting issues in general uh, right. that are surrounding um, um, uh, COVID-19 or coronavirus. So, Many massage therapists are concerned about asymptomatic clients and the current uh, COVID-19 induced or side effect that is uh, clotting issues and that massage could dislodge clots. Um, also, can you talk a little bit about what we currently know about those clotting issues, pulmonary embolisms and DIC, which is dissected. I'm gonna, I might lean on you a little bit for that one, but it's the brain blood clots, I believe. Um, and, uh, and shame on me, I like had it written down and I only abbreviated it in my notes. But how common or rare is this? And, and, and how is 
this clotting different from a typical DVT? And, you know, so that we, I guess my whole point is we're trying to make some, a lot of us are trying to make a decision on whether or not we feel massage is appropriate right now based on that risk. And that's, I think learning more about that will help us make that determination if that makes sense. Right. So this is one area where I really can't give you good guidance. This is really a clinical question and I'm not sure we really understand the clinical um, uh, realm yet anyway. My, but my limited understanding is that um, these blood clotting issues, the whole gamut, are complications, right? So it is unlikely, I believe, for someone to be asymptomatic and have blood clotting issues. Um, so assuming that that is true, it's probably low risk because they will have other symptoms going on. Um, but I'm not certain. So I would really reach out to a clinician who is in the field um, to, to ask some advice on that. My understanding is that it, it d tends to impact younger people, um, and it, I am not aware that it, it would be something that, that would occur with asymptomatic patients because it's considered a complication of it. So it's an extension and an additional problem besides the active disease that the person is experiencing. Um, but yeah, I would confirm that that would be the case. Gotcha. I do know that um, Ruth Werner is our um, kind of pathology, we call her the pathology queen in um, in, in the realm of massage. I know, I think either in the June or July issue of um, one of our industry magazines, she has an article coming out about it, which I think is, you know, that's great because it's someone within our industry that we trust. And um, again, to go back to, it's not always easy for us to disseminate the studies and what we know and what we don't know. So I love that advice. And I appreciate that advice of it's always, it always makes me more confident in someone, which is a side note, when they let, they are honest about where their line is and what they know and don't know. So thank you, Dr. Sherman. I appreciate that. <laughs> There's plenty we don't know, darn it. <laughs> I'm always good at, I'd say, I'd say it's like the number one thing I'm good at in my job. Somebody will ask me, you know, how something works or why something, and I'll go, you know, I, I really oh. don't know. I'll do some research, <laughs> but like, I, I don't, I don't know. So from an epidemiologist standpoint, do you feel the, have you been able to review the John Hopkins guidance for governors and the CDC reopening guidelines? And do you feel that those are reasonable ways for, to head into reopening? Okay, so um, first off, I haven't looked at them in depth. Okay. Um, but they're two, what I consider reputable agencies. So I would trust their guidance assuming that there's no evidence that it's influenced by politics over science, right? And at this point, there isn't any evidence that I am aware of. And in fact, it appears the opposite because the CDC guidelines, you know, that were, were suppressed and not released and that sort of thing. Um, so um, I suspect that it's, uh, that b those guidelines are um, appropriate and useful. What I'm more concerned about is the lack of reliable surveillance data. So we can only assess this risk to health versus benefit to economy ratio um, and, and thinking about um, the non-pharmaceutical interventions if we have good data about the r naught or the transmission, right? So we need that data not only glo uh, globally and for the US, but we also need it at the local level because one size doesn't fit all. You were talking about um, overall, the state of Virginia maybe doesn't have a PPE shortage, but there are going to be some locales where they where it, they do have a shortage, right? So not everything is uniform. So we, we really need that data. And unfortunately, so there's, um, we know that we're not doing enough testing to understand the full picture. We don't understand the current burden of COVID-19. And it's not just the asymptomatic folks. It's just, it's, it's, it's larger than that. But there are also other data collection issues. We, where there's lack of resources. Hospitals are overwhelmed trying to, um, to tabulate this information. There's also high rates of false negatives for some tests. There's a whole bunch of tests out on the market. And we did need them for sure. But not all of them are equal. And there, are, there appears to be a lot of false negatives. So we really don't understand what's happening in our community. So trying to use those guidelines of to open or not reopen 
it, 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 the, the question is not clear even before we get to the guidelines and um, how, to, how to safely reopen. Um, the other problem is increasingly there are reliable reports of data suppression, right, in order to promote the policies of reopening. And that is absolutely devastating. Um, so it's vital that we really have valid surveillance data and we have no hopes of containing this virus without this data either. We're still in the mitigation stage, right? That at this point, if we continue doing what we're doing, eventually most everyone will be exposed to the virus. But if it takes years, then we can handle that and we can appropriately treat them in the hospital. You know, that's the whole flatten the curve. Um, and it's, um, it's a devastating position to be in because we do know a percentage of people will just die from it, mm -hmm. right? Um, so trying to make sure that we have the resources to handle folks that do get sick is, is part of that criteria. And we just don't have the data right now in most states. And it's a, unfortunately a predominantly a political problem yeah. um, to be able to do that appropriately. And then of course, if we did have the data and we did have better testing then the test trace, you know, contact tracing and isolation, that's how we contain it. Um, and so we can't even get to that step. Um, we're, I think a lot of people are sort of hanging their, they're hitching their wagon to, um, the vaccine. Um, and again, that's not something that is likely to come very soon, but with appropriate surveillance data, we will have the information to make better decisions, right? Yeah, so no, that, that, that totally makes sense. And I think, well, because the easy thing, I mean, that was the early days for me was like, it's so easy if it could be black and white. And I could just be like, well, I'm not opening until there's a vaccine. Or, right. you know, I'm going to, you know, or I, you know what, I'm just going to go out because it's going to happen. Like, those are easy decisions. It's these little nuanced things. And, and the suppression again we it's probably not right to get into that right now but it's just um it's sad and especially it's sad because it makes us question so many other things and so yeah i mean like it's a per just to get very personal right now like right now even if my area was open i wouldn't open yet because i just feel like i don't that's one of the reasons we're doing this today i feel like i need more knowledge before I'm able to do that. And also like, we're still a hot spot. So I just, right. I, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I, I just can't. It doesn't mean that someone else's decision is right or wrong. It's, but it's so sad to me that my decision has to come down to only my interpretation of everything and the limited, it, it's hard when that's limited. And that's, I guess where I'll leave it because otherwise I'm gonna get too, it's too, it's, it's too personal and too emotional. Right. Right. Um, I will move on to say, well, I guess, so, so outside of that is, are there any questions that you're surprised I didn't ask about or any other important issues that you think we need to talk about that I didn't mention today? Well, I guess I was a little surprised that you didn't even touch on any of the common conspiracy theory questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, this is related to, you know, as we think about reopening and how we need to change our lives and move forward and how we're going to live with this in the safest way possible, we really need to take into account our whole community. And we are reliant upon everyone in the community to be cautious and appropriate. And I don't want to go down a negative path too far, but right now it's, again, it's really disheartening because we see the information the, the misinformation that's deliberately put out there and the political divides that it's creating and really seem to be growing. And this should be a unifying issue. This is the public's health. It impacts you and I, but the public's health is supposed to be the health of everyone. Um, and these types of conspiracy theories as misinformation and the sharing on social media is really, really damaging. Um, so I was kind of in, uh, happy that you, you didn't have these biases or these, you know, often they're, they're, they're framed as, um, you know, we just want to get the truth. We want to know the truth. Um, so I, I guess I'm glad that you didn't have any of those uh, particular questions, but we can't not 
consider that th that that sort of uh, perspective is also influencing everything that we do and how effective our personal decisions uh, are going to are going to be on protecting the health of our community. Yeah, and that kind of goes right back to what we talked about initially as well, right? And it's like we have to dig a little bit deeper when we hear something and you know especially us as okay it's it's a little bit different for the general public but w we as massage therapists as even as fitness professionals those that are in health wellness and fitness have an obligation to be able to on some level read and understand studies and read and understand and and be able to kind of dig a little bit deeper um, we, we have an obligation to that. And that's, I, and I do try to, you know, and, and I don't want to say it's, 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 you know, some may feel it's more on one side or more on the other, but I honestly, I feel like I've seen on, on, on both sides, this, this is what I feel. So let me gather everything I can around the way I feel. And this is the way I feel. And I know for me, like after our conversation today, I need to rethink a lot of I just need to think a lot more about um, risk in general. And I was certainly on more of the side of like, you know, stay hold up the whole time. And not, not that, I mean, that's a little ridiculous, but. That is, that is zero risk. If you never yeah. encounter anybody, then you are at zero risk. <laughs> yeah. Well, zero risk of that, right? It, but, of just that one, exactly. Yeah, just that one thing. There are other risks, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah. So again, it always comes down to weighing the risks and the benefits. And um, I, I think that that is true. And I think sometimes it's good to also see when you you know see something that is um, a conspiracy theory and also it, that helps you realize what that is and so that you're more it, you're 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 trained more in 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 an ability to kind of understand that language or or how it's being presented to you so now that playing on your emotions absolutely. That, i mean that's that's like a critical piece yeah yeah. yeah. And dude, like as massage therapists, like we're all emotion, man. Like that's, <laughs> that's a gig. That's and like there are conspiracies, yeah. which are very different than conspiracy theories. And I think right now, a lot of these conspiracies, this um, inappropriate politics and all of that, it's being subsumed by these incredible stories that these other con that the conspiracy theories are so they're right. a distraction from some real things that are happening in front of us that w that are actually directly impacting our health and oh. our and our economic situation and and everything so it's a fabulous way to deflect if you don't want somebody to look at what you're doing show them something crazier you know um but so okay so so all that being said um I, I would love to ask you, and you can you can feel free to to decline to answer. But if massage was available today, would you make an appointment, or would you recommend people to wait? And would you visit a gym, indoors or outdoors? So again, if you're not comfortable answering that because I've moved it to personal, right. that's fine. But um, I would just love to kind of hear your thoughts. So I talked earlier about the types of um, activities that are lower risks versus high risk. Um, so I probably would do Pilates or yoga indoors, but I would not do Zumba outdoors, for instance. Um, but when I think about a massage, um, the closeness, of course, makes it more risky. And, um, but how I would evaluate that decision is um, I would think about what my community looks like today. So I'm in Los Angeles County we are not ready to open gyms. So the answer for me today would be no. The other thing that I would think about is my relationship with the massage therapist. I would have to be comfortable and have a good relationship and have trust with that person. Um, and I, unfortunately, I don't, I don't have a therapist with whom I have that relationship with, right? So that's another reason that I would be less likely to, um, to um, seek out a massage right now. But you know, we're also in need of its benefits. Um, if I could take an appointment outside sometime, maybe late June, July, I would do it in a heartbeat. Um, because there, you know, we are all, um, 
we're all going through the same level of anxiety where, that can really benefit from something like massage. So um, I'd, be, I'd be much more willing to take that risk if it were outside, probably maybe even today, actually, if mm -hmm. I had someone that I was comfortable with. Um, but we don't have that situation. So for right now, my personal decision would be no. Great. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate all your time, Dr. Sherman. I appreciate um, all your pre-work. I gave you 20 questions after, you know, I, I was, and, and I was, you were so kind because I said, I, I completely understand that this is an overwhelming list. And, and if you can't get to them all, and you were so kind and so generous to research them all. Um, I, I just thank you. Oh, that, that really, it's no problem. I really appreciate the time to be able to communicate a little bit about this. And um, I think there might be a few that we didn't answer directly. So I have notes. If you want me to write them up more formally, I'd be happy to do that. Oh, my goodness. I mean, that would be above and beyond, but I would be so grateful. And another question I might have for you is I, I, I have a feeling in the coming weeks as uh, different um, uh, uh, different locations start to open, and as we kind of see what this new world looks like uh, for us, uh, there may be some additional questions that come up. Um, if if I have people field those questions through me, would you be willing to perhaps uh, uh, for, be available for some follow up? Absolutely, absolutely. I would be honored to. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Well, Dr. Sherman, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. If someone has like a pressing question, um, is, there, is there a way that they can get in touch with you? What's the, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Um, well, I think probably um, the Facebook public forum type thing um, would be the best um, to uh, keep it separate from say my, my my private social life or my my work life, um, but I do post publicly information from time to time as well that I think is important for people to think about, um, specifically related to COVID nineteen. Um, so I, I'm I'm accessible there for sure. Fabulous. So I'll include that in the notes, and I just would love everybody to kind of just be um, respectful in that Dr. Sherman does have a full time job where she's doing some wonderful work uh, centered around cancer and. Um, uh, so just to give her some time uh, to answer those questions, or definitely I would love anybody that has additional questions or things that they're concerned about, whether it's specific to health, wellness, and fitness, or um, otherwise, to filter those through me so that we can do a follow-up session. Dr. Sherman, thank you again. Any closing notes for us? Um, I don't think so, but I hope to... Uh interact with you again. Yeah, <laughs> this absolutely. has been a lot of fun. <laughs> it, was, it was a lot of fun. Um, until our next episode, everyone, I am not going to go with my usual sign off and I'm just going to say, wash your hands, man. <laughs> <laughs> Always <laughs> excellent advice. <laughs> Thanks.